You know, I thought we were done with this with Velma, but something not right's going on over at HBO Discovery, you know what I'm saying? Earlier in the year, they cut like all their animation, they removed all the old stuff so like you can't even buy DVDs anymore. They cut a ton of projects that were in the middle of or sometimes like right at the end of production. And now, right in the middle of 2023, as if things weren't bad enough, we have the worst show since Velma called The Idol. Now, initially I was not gonna do a video about this just because like, you know, it's just another dumb show that everyone's hating on and like I have zero thoughts about Lily Rose Depp or The Weeknd or whatever, so like, why would I even bother? But then we decided to sit down and actually watch it. I mean, come on, clearly this is just the internet hate bandwagon, you know, because that's that's what they do, and there's there's no way the show is really that bad, right? Right? Right, guys? So yeah, we sat down and we watched it, and, uh... <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness. For any show to get made, there's like a huge list of people who have to sign off on it, right? Like very rarely does any showrunner or show creator person like just get to do whatever they want. So that means for this show to be out now and watchable, like that means everyone thought that this was like good enough. That's why I'm saying something's not right over at HBO. Now, a ton of people have already made videos about the show already back when the first episode came out, but I wanted to wait for at least two or three episodes to really get a sense of like where the show is going and what they're trying to do. Like, like with Velma, everyone was reacting to and clowning on the first two episodes, just blissfully unaware of how much worse the show got as it went on. And so in the same vein, let me tell you right now, okay, if you only watched the first episode or videos about the first episode of The Idol, you have no idea how lucky you are. So let's take a walk and really question the value of the human species. Also, I know I'm like the 500th person to make a video about the show, so I'm probably not going to say anything like totally original right now, but that's just because we're all talking about the same show, so what are you going to do? Now, it's no secret that this show is full of crap, but you know what else is full of crap is you, probably. And that's why today's sponsor is... <laughs> that's why today's sponsor is Colon Broom. As you can probably guess from the very on-the-nose name, Colon Broom is a prebiotic that helps keep you regular, reduces things like bloating, constipation, reduces your risk of diabetes, and also makes your skin visibly better. Like Jocelyn's skin in the show, which I can only assume is going to end up on Tedros' wall at some point, but whatever. Anyway, as I mentioned here and there, I lived in Japan for 12 years, and one thing that struck me a lot when I lived there is that people are so open about about talking about uh, being constipated or you know, the opposite. And Colin Broom's mission is to turn the solid wall of stigma around this stuff into a smooth, voluminous, open discussion. You just take a teaspoon of Colin Broom with a full glass of water, and the xylem husk expands in your stomach and digestive tract to clean it all out, shall we say. And like I just said earlier, this can have a lot of benefits, like reducing your risk of colon cancer, reducing your risk of diabetes because it slows down sugar absorption, it clears up your skin, it's a great conversation starter at your grandma's funeral. Now, just to be clear, okay, this is not a laxative, all right? This is not some kind of weight loss, Kardashian diarrhea tummy tea or whatever, okay? This is a soluble fiber supplement that just helps keep everything running smooth. Simple as that. Right now, Colon Broom is having a huge sale where you can get six months of their product for 65% off. Plus, use my code Myers10. You get an additional 10% off. So if anything I've said here appeals to you at all, there's no better time than now. So click my link down below and give Colon Broom a try today. Okay, back to this masterpiece of cinema. <laughs> So our main character is Jocelyn, who is a famous pop star who kind of just had everything going for her until her mom died last year, which makes her a Disney princess, I guess. Now, losing your mom and not knowing how to process that would be a perfectly reasonable setup for a character, or, you know, the motivation for why she does what she does. But right from the beginning of the show, it does the thing that quite a few popular shows do that I personally find incredibly boring and annoying, which is that Jocelyn literally has, like, no personality or anything really going for her. The only thing that makes her interesting is her trauma. You know, shows like this one or, like, Euphoria, which is made by the same person. It's like, they do this thing where the trauma is the main character, and like, the person themselves is just a vessel through which the trauma is like, manifested or something. But what is the image saying? That she's young, beautiful, and damaged. The robe. Mm -hmm. The hospital wristband. I mean, are, are we romanticizing mental illness? Absolutely. I just don't think that with everything that she had been through, she should be wearing the hospital wristband. Mental illness is sexy. This right here is basically the mission statement of the whole show. On her own, the character Jocelyn has nothing going on, okay? She seems to have no sense of humor. After watching half of the six episode run of the first season, she has very few thoughts or feelings about anything, really. And maybe you could chalk this up to her being lost without her mom, but the whole point of the beginning of the show, at least, is her, like, hiding how she really feels and trying to pretend like nothing really happened. But, like, it's 2023 and we're just doing the whole Bella Swan thing again, you know? Like, she's maybe she's supposed to just be, like, a wood board so you can insert yourself into the story, but I mean, I don't know, man. I feel like we all got over this like 10 years ago, you know what I mean? So Jocelyn has had a pretty marketable, family-friendly kind of image, but since losing her mom, she wants to really dig into the darkness. 
and show the world that she's not just some wholesome, squeaky clean Disney Channel kid. And this brings us to the first conflict of the show, which is where she's doing a photo shoot and wants to show her boobies, but she can't because of contract stipulations. The nudity writer's already been negotiated with the label and her people and how are you? Hi. What are we talking about? Your nudity writer. It's very strict. It is my body. Yes. If you want to show your body, which would be great, we have to change the nudity writer. It uh, takes at least 48 hours. And then they deal with this by getting mad at the intimacy coordinator and locking him in a bathroom so Jocelyn can just do whatever she wants. So I'll talk more about this later, but this is the first of many examples of how the show is so hilariously tone deaf and just like try hard edgy that it almost becomes like a parody of a parody of itself. It's kind of like how Velma was an adult cartoon that literally went out of its way to make fun of adults who watch cartoons. Well, all our classmates are idiots or sheep, so let's assume they're high. Man, if I ever even think about getting into 420, 420 culture, or especially 420 related humor, kill me. You know what 420 is, right? Um, yeah, it's code for adults who still watch cartoons. But I mean, it's 2023, post Me Too, post Harvey Weinstein, post Epstein, all these like major events have transpired. And like this show thinks it's being cleverly edgy by having the characters get upset about the protections that were put in place to stop future Harvey Weinstein dudes from like doing the creepy stuff, you know what I'm saying? On the one hand, I get that yes, it is Jocelyn's body and so she can do whatever she wants with it and, and you know, that's fair. But on the other hand, like there's so much context as to why it has to be this way. And for HBO, AKA Warner Brothers, AKA one of the biggest names in TV and movies and who has worked with Weinstein, these people are making a show where the first major point is how protecting talent from creepy people is annoying. Like who signed off on this? It's, it's like they're just being contrarian for the sake of it. But even worse than that, okay, the show makes a whole hullabaloo about this for like 15 minutes and ultimately Ultimately, this has nothing to do with what happens in the show. I guess you could say that it kind of parallels this other part where a spicy photo of Jocelyn gets leaked on the internet and her team scrambles to get it taken down and not let Jocelyn herself know about it, while also championing her to break the intimacy rules and show her body as much as she wants. And like, maybe they think that they're saying something clever here. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is literally just the swimsuit versus underwear conversation. Like, someone is okay with you seeing them in a swimsuit, but not okay with you seeing them in less revealing underwear because the context of the situation is totally different. I feel like we all learned this in seventh grade, my dude. Like, this is this is hardly the clever, subversive statement you think it is. Now, as the show goes on, we learn that the whole thing with Jocelyn is that she's obsessed with being a bad girl, TM. And so her new song is about how she's a freak, yeah, and doesn't care what your name is, yeah, and you better have a bank account, yeah because it's weird that you bury gold bricks in your backyard, yeah? And how come all the guys I date only use cash and have seven phones, yeah? But the whole shtick of the show is that she hates this new song because it's like a little bit more edgy or whatever, but she doesn't feel like the real her, man. And she wants to go like super dirty, mature bad girl and her team won't let her because they think it's not like commercial enough to sell. I mean, okay, I'll go first. I mean, it's not happening. It's not. I mean, what? What? Well, hold on. It's, hold on. it's hey, not Nikki. happening. It's okay. not. Heim, don't. Okay, but Nikki, this this is something that like no one's doing. Well, Nobody the, yeah, sounds like this. Yeah, there's a reason no one is doing this right now. It's this is not commercial. Okay, but I told you. And like this is the crux of the whole show as we go into episodes two and three. But much like with the whole intimacy coordinator thing, the show feels like it was written by someone who just woke up from cryostasis or something. Like with Jocelyn's team, I guess we're supposed to see like the real controlling hypocrisy of the music industry and like the whole motivation for what Jocelyn wants wants to do, but the team is worried that like it's not going to work out and like, it's going to blow back on them or something. But like, are we all just going to pretend that the ex-Tina arc and like WAP never happened? Or how Miley Cyrus's We Can't Stop was like a huge hit song? It's like we're supposed to see the real dirty underbelly of the music industry and then they just ignore what's been happening in the music industry for like 20 years. Now ultimately all this leads Jocelyn to end up meeting this weird little dude named Tedros. <laughs> Now, I just want to be clear here, okay? I have zero opinions about The weekend as an artist, as a person, as a celebrity. Like, I'm not a fan, I'm not a hater, I, I'm simply aware of his existence. I was assuming that a lot of the hate for the show is coming from people who are pretending to have opinions about Mr. Weekend and his, like, acting ability or lack thereof. Because, you know, he's a huge famous artist and he's supposed to be playing this suave, sexy cult leader guy or whatever. But in the sense of fairness, okay, I have watched the first three episodes and I can tell you right now that whatever Mr. Weekend is going for with his character... <laughs> Like, it is, it is not working. <laughs> This character could have been interesting, maybe if someone else was playing him, because like he's supposed to be this very charismatic dude who worms his way into Jocelyn's life and starts taking over everything, right? But I mean, like there's nothing alluring or charismatic about this dude at all. I can't. 
glass. Like, I mean, <laughs> sunglasses in a club is already a choice. But then he does this, and like, <laughs> this has never worked for anyone. Okay, this dude looks like the kid from Blank Check. And he has a rat tail. Like, really, Jocelyn? Really? You can have any dude you want, and you pick this one? A lot of people get into some bad stuff in their lives, and they eventually kind of have their, like, rock bottom, I need to get my life together kind of moment, right? Like, dating a dude with a rat tail is about as rock bottom as you can get. <laughs> Like, like, this should be a bigger wake-up call than any intervention could hope to be. Over the last few years, we've been getting quite a few of these, like, shows and movies where it's like, they took the worst parts of Twilight and decided to just, like, make that the focus. Like, the after movies, 365 Days, Beautiful Disaster, The Idol, you know, it's like, there's this whole genre of, like, weird dude meets boring girl and we're supposed to think he's hot or something. I mean, this show makes Twilight look like a masterpiece, okay? Watching Tedros makes me want to apologize to Edward, like, perhaps we all judged you a little too harshly, okay? And much like Jocelyn, the character of Tedros is not interesting or deep or anything. He's just this weird dude who says and does everything in the cringiest way possible. Well. Yes. Uh. What? Um. Thank you for that. <sighs> Hello, Angel. Hello, Angel. Now, to be fair, I guess we could ask if this character is supposed to be cringy, as in, like, he, the character, is acting relatably awkward to get Jocelyn to lower her defenses or something. But I think that's giving the show a little too much credit, because over episodes two and three, like, we are definitely supposed to find him sexy at certain points, and, like, <laughs> is, is not, there's, <laughs> there's no way. Like, I mean, come on. If you're gonna sing a song called I'm a Freak... You should at least sing it like you know how to fire truck. Imagine my fat tongue while I suffocate you with my Shrek. What was it? How is this a real show? But somehow, against all odds, he does wiggle his way into Jocelyn. <laughs> I think I'm gonna invite Tedros over. The rat tail club guy? Yeah. What's wrong with him? He's so rapey. Yeah, I kind of like that about him. <sighs> Again, like, here's the show being so try-hard edgy, but like, my dude, we already did this back with Insatiable. Okay, remember that show? He's a man and a total dilf. Nope. Don't mind any. Ugh, are you crazy? He's a child molester. Which means I might actually have a shot. Like, is your goal to just be worse than insatiable? Because I gotta be honest, it's actually kind of impressive. And like, there's a scene at the end of episode two where I guess we're supposed to see that Jocelyn has like joined the family when they all stand around singing this song by the piano. And like, this song is just like, I don't know, I just found it to be like the funniest thing. I'm not gonna play it for obvious reasons, but the lyrics go, that's my family. We don't like each other very much and I'm okay with that, but it breaks my mother's heart. And they just repeat this line over and over for like 10 minutes. It's just the most literal song and like, I I think it's supposed to be some kind of like emotional moment in the show where Jocelyn like fully converts to the Tedros family cult or whatever, but like it's just this weird random song. Now this culminates into episode three where Tedros is doing his like culty cult thing of making people open up about their dark secrets so he can use them against them, I assume. And we learned that Jocelyn's relationship with her mom was a little more complicated than we first thought. I'm not gonna let you keep secrets either. Um, she did a lot of things, a lot of things. Hitting me with a hairbrush. Why'd she do that? To focus. She did it as like a form of uh, motivation, I guess. She'd do it if I overate, if I if I didn't exercise or... Now before I go on, okay, like in the past I've had people choose to misinterpret what I've said. So I just want to be very clear that I'm not minimizing this trauma or victim blaming or anything like that, okay? But to me, there's a big difference between a real person in real life actually going through this kind of thing, like Jeanette McCurdy, for example, versus a TV show that was written by a committee of writers and producers and a bunch of people deciding what kind of traumatic experience they're going to purposely give a character to invoke the biggest audience response. Kind of like what I just said about the contextual difference between swimsuit versus underwear. Like, to me, the context of someone going through something like this in real life and a fictional character who's going through something that was decided by a company that wants to maximize revenue from new subscribers, like, I see these things as completely different, even if the traumatic experience in question is the same. Personally, in my opinion, I've always kind of found these trauma attainment shows to be at best kind of silly and at worst like really gross. And how, like, the fundamental appeal of them is to just see like how much of a train wreck the character
just turn into. Especially given what happens after this. Okay, so what ends up happening is Tedros like halfway convinces her, but also she kind of wants this anyway, but he ends up doing the thing that her mom did to her with a hairbrush because she thinks that she needs it to like harness her true self. Basically, the show is just trying to be Fight Club. That's all. They're just making Fight Club, but worse. But at the very least, okay, in Fight Club, Brad Pitt's character was very attractive, alluring, and he said all these things that made you feel like really smart, you know, when you were 14. And this show, The Idol, is trying to do that, but like, <laughs> like, <laughs> nope. If Tedros heard you say that, you'd be in huge trouble. You're not allowed to say no. Why? <sighs> because by saying no, you're denying yourself an experience. Yeah, but not all experiences are good. Some of the most terrible experiences in life can be the most valuable, like artistically. This is like how college freshmen talk. Like this is only deep when you've never done anything in your life before and you want to pretend that you're some kind of edgy, like I don't give a frick kind of person, but like your parents still pay for everything, you know? That's who this show is for. Mental illness is sexy. <sighs> I could go on and on about like every little thing in this show, but the main takeaway here is that it's trying to be really edgy in like a 14 year old kid kind of way, like just for the sake of being edgy and having people post screenshots on Twitter or whatever. Well then let's cancel the tour. Think, why are you saying this? The tour's gonna make millions of dollars. What happened? M millions of dollars? Right now she's making me have IBS. I'm shitting more blood than a kid at Epstein's Island. <sighs> like. Like, come on. I'm not here to police humor or jokes or whatever, but like, if you're gonna try and be all edgy like this, at least you gotta make it funny or something. Like I've said before, it's the same school of writing as Velma, where the characters would just say these hilariously shocking things for like, no reason. Uh, I do miss my mom. Uh, prison is cool, but nobody watches me pee quite like mother. But just like with the intimacy coordinator scene or the hairbrush part or, or countless other things in the first three episodes, like it's not really so much like offensive or shocking or whatever, but it's just like really tone deaf and like, it's so try hard in like the laziest way they could. Much like Euphoria, in my opinion, the show is just about enjoying other people's trauma that you don't have to go through yourself. Like I said earlier, it's really just another traumatainment show where really the main, main reason most people are gonna watch it is just to see how much of a train wreck the characters turn into, you know, so they can be like, wow, isn't this so sad? Like, this is so sad. OMG, this show is like so sad. Like throughout the show, we see how Tedros is clearly just doing the cult thing of lying to and manipulating Jocelyn to get what he wants from her. What are you doing right now? No, I'm just at the club. Are you with people? No, it's just me here. It's so late, I thought you'd be like, sleeping or something. Really? You don't seem like you're from New York. Never been told that before. Oh, I've never been in New York. And this is, I think, supposed to be paralleled by her record label team and how they also lie to and manipulate her into doing what they want her to do. Left it literally right there. Really? That That's so weird. Do you like the single? It's like edgy, but like in a cool way. It's really good. See, and then we spend millions sending you around the world. And now you're going to sit here and tell me that it's not me. So I guess we're supposed to be like, you know, Tedros is running a cult, but actually Jocelyn's already been in a cult the whole time. Maybe this show is actually some kind of 5D chess allegorical satire on the state of trauma attainment and like, who's the real cult, you know? Yeah, you're just sitting here watching this girl throw her life away and then you're going to put on your favorite true crime podcast because you just can't get enough of this, can you? You sick fuck. But I think that's giving it way too much credit. The writing, the acting, the themes, like everything about this show is mid to stupid. <sighs> Except, of course, Jenny from Blackpink because she is absolutely perfect and the best part of the show and she should have been the main character and everything she does is perfect and I am definitely totally not reading this under duress. But I will say though, it looks very pretty and if you like butts, there's a lot of those. Like I said in my Velma video, I think there could have been a pretty good, pretty clever show in here. The ideas themselves could be worked into a show that really, like, actually says something and the characters themselves could have been interesting to watch. Like, the setup of the show itself is fine and maybe even kind of realistic, but the execution is just, I mean, woof. Hey everybody, thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please watch another one because that's how the algorithm works. So click on this one that's being recommended to you right now, right here on the screen. It actually helps a lot if you do that because like that's how YouTube knows that my videos are worth caring about. Also, if you have any movies or TV shows you'd like to recommend, send me an email at alexmyerscontact at gmail.com and I'll put them on my absurdly long list of movies that I need to get to at some point. Anyway, hope I made your day a little bit better and I'll see you all next time.